How is data literacy the engine of successful digital transformations within the manufacturing industry? And how can executive leaders in all industries accelerate outcomes by transforming their workforce? In this episode of Data Humanized, we'll answer these questions with Dr. Andy Moore, the Chief Data Officer at Bentley Motors. So buckle up, make sure your airbags are working, and please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Andy Moore. Welcome to Data Humanized, presented by Correlation One. In each episode, we bring you the unique perspective of enterprise leaders at the intersection of technology and humanity who are leading cultural transformation with the power of data. You'll also hear the real life stories of learners who have graduated from the Data Science for All program and who are embarking on new career pathways, creating a more inclusive, collaborative, and effective workforce. I'm your host, Mark Palmer. Please visit the Correlation One website for more about how data literacy programs transform enterprises and tell your friends about the Data Humanized podcast. Everyone knows that industry 4.0 technologies like blockchain, artificial intelligence, and automation are rapidly changing the manufacturing industry. According to research, companies that fail to adopt technologies like AI could see a 23% reduction in cash flow by 2025. So leaders must roll out these innovations quickly and efficiently. But here's the problem. Most workers lack the digital skills to successfully deploy industry 4.0 technologies. And many manufacturing companies don't know where to begin to solve that skills gap. Over 30% don't have a workforce strategy to handle the problem. So digital leaders must recognize that one of the biggest pitfalls out there is to ignore the critical role that the workforce plays in making their technology rollout successful. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Andy Moore, Chief Data Officer from Bentley Motors. We'll learn about how data literacy is the engine of his transformation strategy and how he structures his organization for success, and also why digital talent and skills should be a top concern for enterprise leaders. Hi everyone, this is Mark Palmer. Today I'm joined by Dr. Andy Moore from Bentley, um, a name and a brand probably everyone knows, but might not know um, about how they manage data. And uh, Andy is the chief data officer there. So uh, it's great to have him join us on uh, Data Humanized. Welcome, Andy. Thank you. Great to be here. Let's start with maybe a little introduction to yourself. And if you don't mind, um, if you can tell us um, you know, about your role at Bentley. And um, I'm fascinated to hear about your, your post-grad work on organizational ambidexterity. <laughs> I'm not even sure I did. I said it right, but uh, no, yeah, good. Tell, tell us, uh, tell us about that. I'm always curious what people do their, uh, their, their advanced uh, thinking on research, cool. and how it applies to, to, to Bentley, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's two things I'm, I'm getting used to uh, in the last 12 months is the doctor title and the, uh, and the chief data officer title. Both were new last year. Um, so yeah, if I start, uh, I started my career uh, 25 years ago in the automotive industry. Uh, I started as an MVH engineer, um, and part of that role was gathering data, um, noise and vibration data to make decisions, visualize outcomes, uh, to make better decisions, to make the best, uh, in this case, luxury car possible. Um, I've spent a lot of my career at Bentley, moved from engineering into uh, product management, um, I then uh, moved into digitalization about four years ago, helped set up that department. And it was about that time that I set, uh, set out on my doctoral journey as well uh, in, in my spare time, um, because I recognized the automotive industry was changing and changing quite rapidly. We talk about a number of disruptors. Uh, electrification is one of them. Um, the connected services that are being uh, offered more and more is another one. Uh, how we how we communicate with our customers and, and even um, sell our cars to the customers. The retail model uh, has the potential to change from almost an on-demand basis uh, through to the traditional ownership model. There's, there's a number of disruptors uh, coming at the industry. So we uh, set up the digitization department within Bentley to, to look at these new technologies and how we how we move what, what is a hundred year old uh, automotive company into its next century. And that led me to starting to, to establishing the self-service analytics uh, capability at Bentley, um, which was getting people out of uh, Excel and into service reporting. Um, and then that led me to building the data strategy um, to, to address the, the deeper uh, challenges beyond that of how do we get uh, data governed, get data centralized, 
uh, build a data literacy program and enable value across the business, which uh, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get into discussing that a lot more shortly. The ambidextrous nature of it, I think I learned from Harvard Business Review and, and from reading some of the, the stuff that you've written is sort of like simultaneously doing incremental architectural and discon discontinuous innovation, mm -hmm. right? Um, which totally makes sense in the automobile industry, right? Because you all you have to maintain and, and incrementally make the existing you know vehicles better, while changing the platform, while like electrifying things, right? Or you know, Absolutely. and like you said, changing the way the cars are connected now. So there's a three mm -hmm. sort of levels of of innovation that you need to do sort of simultaneously or ambidextrously. Ambidextrous, yes. <laughs> yes. It's a challenge, isn't it? Because we need to uh, continue to invest in our current models because we need to generate the profit in order to invest in our future. But we also need to allocate a certain amount of resource to be successful and introduce that next wave of uh, full electrification uh, models in the future. Let's jump in uh, and talk about, uh, well, I mean, really, why Bentley? I mean, you, okay. you're, you're, you've got a, a great background. Obviously, you've um, uh, done this uh, academic work. What, what was it that got you excited about Bentley specifically and the CDO role there. I could imagine a lot of things, but what, what was it that really got you fired up about it? Yeah, so when I first started at Bentley, uh, we only made 800 cars a year. Uh, we now make 15,000 cars a year. So over the period that I've been here, we've already seen great growth in, in our markets and, and our customers. Uh, but I believe there's a lot more to go at in terms of the future and how we interact with our customer. The new challenges, the disruption that is coming allows us to have a much uh, deeper uh, relationship with our customer, have a, almost a one-to-one -one relationship, hyper-personalized, which is super important in the luxury market, and, and build products that our customers want and be able to personalize them heavily. And as we build on our legacy systems, uh, there is a lot of transformation still to be done and a lot of opportunity to to drive real change within the business. And uh, as Bentley is a, a renowned international uh, brand, uh, recognized it's great to be at the forefront of that uh, driving the adoption of new technology and, and really having impact um, within the business but also uh, yeah to our customer base as well. 800 to 15,000 so I've learned something new that's pretty incredible so you write a lot about you know efficiency and digital transformation right uh, over the entire business and I think you've got also uh, your organizational uh, thinking and uh, research probably plays into this can you talk about anything you you feel it happens uniquely um, within Bentley. And of course, you're part of the larger automobile group as well. Maybe talk about how you cross those silos with data, and sort of anything particular that you've, you've found that other people could learn from. So I think it, it's great being part of the Volkswagen group uh, uh, as a general, uh, and the Volkswagen group includes some great brands such as Audi and Porsche and Lamborghini, uh, all of whom we work closely with as well. Uh, and it's good to learn off each other because uh, solutions that are right for building golfs, that we, uh, we build a golf uh, in Germany once every nine seconds, compared to building a Bentley once every nine minutes. Uh, th there's a scale there in terms of data generated and, and therefore investment in solutions that's needed. That means that uh, solutions that are right on, on a scale for Volkswagen and Golf is not necessarily the right solution for, for Bentley and the volume that we produce, but also the, the high personalization that we uh, strive to achieve and the individual customer journeys. So it's about getting right size solutions. Um, the, there was a lot of paper-based uh, processes uh, when I started at Bentley. So it's moving away from those paper-based processes to automate um, where appropriate. It's about the volume of data um, at 15,000 cars a year. We could run the business on Excel uh, and some areas still try to run it on Excel, but uh, that's not really the most sustainable or, or efficient way of doing it, particularly when you're trying to communicate across a, a complex business and, and have a single source of truth. And it's about getting that investment level right. We're not going to set up a, a uh, an in-depth bespoke uh, data server on site because it doesn't make sense from an investment point of view. But we can leverage best of breed technology to get the, the outcomes that we want and deliver business value at a, at a return on investment that makes sense for Bentley and then share that learning as well. Do you measure that um, 
that sort of proliferation of self-service? I mean, I know you're a, uh, I think an ambassador for, for Tableau and you've gotten folks off of Excel, right? I think I have that right, mm -hmm. the, the, the title correctly. Do you measure like how many people are accessing data, you know, systematically or like how do you measure maturity there going from, mm -hmm. you know, paper <laughs> and uh, then I guess Excel and now, and now self-service mm -hmm. analytics? How do you think about that as a CDO? So, uh it starts with, uh, with with driving efficiency. The the first uh, place we started at was um, it takes a lot of time to create bespoke reports in Excel, then put it into a PowerPoint presentation, then PDF it, then circulate it for email for then an exec to go, oh, I didn't want to ask that question. I want to ask another question to then go away for a week and, and return the numbers and produce another report. So in, in the first instance, it's speed to insight and efficiency of, of people's time. If people are, are sat in Excel building dashboards, they're not necessarily helping to answer the business questions and uh, driving better outcomes. Uh, they're focused more on the process of producing a graph than they are on what should we do about the graph and, and let's drive better outcomes. So that's where we started out um, in terms of measuring the benefit, and we measured good return on investment in the first uh, two years of of, of rolling that out. Uh, and then I think as our data maturity increases, it's then uh, more and more about how we use that data to drive those decisions. So we, we might almost over, uh, over index on publishing dashboards to start with, because we're at least getting them on a central server, getting them on people's iPads and phones, uh, access from anywhere, as well as uh, on uh, web browsers uh, and not on pieces of paper. So that's the first step. But then it's really the guided analytics uh, journey of, you know, let's say we publish uh, the top 40 KPIs across the business on a single dashboard, which of those 40 KPIs need attention today, this week, this month, and can we guide our, uh, the decision makers and people that can make a difference, whether that's on the shop floor or, or whether it's uh, at exec and board level, can we guide uh, people's attention to what needs uh, decisions where we can make an impact where we can, you know, drive efficiency or increase our bottom line. It's a good story of uh, democratization of access. And in fact, you, I got to say, you sound like a chief analytics officer, a little bit more than a chief data officer, or maybe <laughs> how do you, how do you, get, how do you organize that internally? Because I mean, clearly they're intertwined, right? And it's a sort of, yeah, sometimes you'll find people with Absolutely. both titles or they're, they're, they're silo, but you really almost speak. You're, you're speaking as much about the, uh, the analytics side as the data. Yeah, I think that's a, an interesting topic on its own that could take a half hour podcast just to discuss. But my view is I, I, I wanted to set up a central data office to enable the business. You know, sales and marketing know the sales challenges. They know the after sales challenges. They know what they're trying to achieve. Um, and they're familiar at, at least with their data, even if they haven't got the tools to enable them to get the data to their fingertips um, as quickly as they would like. And it's the same with manufacturing. They know their processes, they know their challenges. We know our quality challenges. I'm never, as, as chief data officer, going to know all of those challenges. I'm lucky I've got deep experience at Bentley and across Bentley and work closely with a number of stakeholders. I have a lot of business empathy but I can't possibly get my hands around all the data. So my view is I need to enable the, the business with the, with the skills, the tools, and the underlying processes to, to make them make the most decisions because data on its own is, is simply a cost, but data used to make decisions is where you get the outcomes and, and drive the benefits. Uh, and it will be sales and marketing that increase sales. It's manufacturing that um, increases uh, volume or, or increases quality. It's those metrics that really uh, drive results, not the fact we've got another 10 dashboards published. There's the idea of everybody, the mantra being to be data driven. I always kind of rail against that and talk, try to talk about being decision driven instead. And you've kind of said that uh, nicely. So mm -hmm. I think that's a good segue to talk about the team and the organization, right? Um, so your, your data organization, how do you, how do you think about that? Is it centralized, decentralized? You know, I, I love your example of, you know, you're, you're not, you don't know the day-to-day -day challenges of the sales organization versus manufacturing, although you do a lot, but not intimately. So you try to empower them. How do you, how do you um, sort of be centralized, but decentralized at the same time? I think it's about building that empowerment platform. And that's why I'm passionate about data literacy and building, uh, building future talent and current experience talent as well. 
the data literacy program goes hand in hand with the with the tools, um, you know, the data cloud and the visualization tools, which goes hand in hand with the governance and the enablement as well. You can't have one without the other, uh, I believe. So if we're able to uh, enable the business to make better use of their of their data by asking better questions, then we get the efficiencies by then building the dashboards that people want to see and make use of. We don't have uh, you know, tech, tech debt of, of dashboards published and forgotten. Uh, we make more usable uh, use of the dashboards uh, and therefore we're giving people really the tools to, to get value from it. And then as a central area, we're able to maybe join some of the dots as well of, of how can manufacturing make use of some customer data for example, so we can help join the dots as well as part of the enablement because we get to we get the privileged position of, of seeing across the business and and you know really seeing under the hood of how Bentley works. So it's like a network almost. So you've got these these different areas, and then you're trying to look for cross um, value uh, generation across them. Well, talk, talk about data literacy. You said the magic word there. We're very much about you know how do we democratize access to this. So do, how do you think about that throughout your organization? I know you have. Um, I think the UK term is uh, it's not internship, but it's uh, uh, apprentice programs, right? You 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 you've talked about that on social media, so. How do you how do you think about that in and sort of execute it inside Bentley too? You know, make it make it happen. Get more people involved in data. So I think uh, that there's two elements to that. One, as you mentioned, the apprenticeship. So what's relatively new and and fairly unique to UK is the degree uh, is the professional degree apprenticeship. So the, there is now a, an apprenticeship route as a data scientist, uh, where I take people from as school leavers. Um, and, and they still complete a degree, but over four years rather than three, whilst getting real world experience and, and delivering, uh, you know, valuable business projects as they go. Um, so I was very passionate about opening that uh, route up to people uh, and going to schools and, and talking about these opportunities because uh, they they certainly weren't open when I uh, was making my, my university decisions. And I think because of that, a lot of other parents maybe are, uh, you know, the, the university route is, is the obvious route, whereas going down the degree apprentice route, you still get your degree, but uh, you also get a very valuable CV at the end of your four years and also no debt because you're earning and your degree's paying for. So I've been very passionate about building that pipeline and, and building a year on year intake. So I've got a cohort of uh, degree data scientists that the, you know, the year threes and year fours can help the year ones and year twos. Uh, and that peer support and, and peer, peer encouragement uh, really builds a body of work. And it's uh, really, um, you know, one of the great pleasures of my role is, is seeing that some of these great superstars that are coming through uh, these programs and delivering really valuable projects because they're you know, unencumbered from 20 years of uh, this is the way we do things. They come in with a clean, clean mindset. They've, they've you know, grown up with a phone in their hand and uh, a different perspective. Um, and are able to ask questions of, you know, we use, we could use the term reverse mentoring. They're they're offering value to to execs because they are able to work with them to to provide solutions to their challenges. You know, I've got people working with manufacturing, uh, providing uh, solutions to their uh, data communication. Uh, we, you know, we talk about the, the manufacturing dashboards, uh, sales, and marketing as well, and they they can uh, add value to the business straight away. Um, by, by helping answer business questions. So I think one aspect is bringing in this, uh, this new level or this new um, generation of, uh, of talent um, because it, it, we have to, you know, we're always moving forward. We, we need that uh, new mindset, that new approach uh, to, to come in. Our customers are getting younger as well. Um, so we, we as a business need that diverse uh, thought in every sense of the word. Um, especially my team is 85% female, which I'm, um, I didn't set out for any particular metric, but I'm proud of the diversity that is within the team because you can see the benefit of that on a, on a day-to-day basis. So that's a great outcome. I got, I, I got to ask about that. I was going to, I was going to make the joke that it must be so easy for you to recruit, uh, college students into work for Bentley. That's important. I imagine for your company to get that kind of diverse input into the actual internal process. 
Yeah, and unfortunately, it isn't as easy as we would like to think because uh, in... <laughs> Sorry, I, I figured it wasn't as easy as it would appear. I would agree, outside, it's a no-brainer, yeah. right? You get paid to, to get your degree uh, yeah. with no debt uh, at the end of it. Yeah. But um, still, it, it's a relatively new thing, the professional degree apprentice within the UK, uh, and, and still there's a lot of encouragement to go straight to university. So we have, uh, I've put a lot of effort into uh, networking, joining schools networks as well to, to kind of spread the message. Uh, and then as I've built the team, the first year, the first year is always the hardest, but then you turn those, uh, the first and second year, uh, apprentices into ambassadors as well and they go back to their old schools and we're part of other uh, networks as an automotive 30 percent network that encourages females into into mm -hmm. the industry so we we are active in those networks to try and spread the message that uh it's a great career path uh, they might not all end up at bentley but at least consider a, a, a professional apprenticeship as a as a very positive career choice and career route um, because yeah, not only are you debt free, you also get such a great CV at the end of it. And, you know, seeing how people have uh, developed from school leavers into professionals within the space of four years and what a strong CV they've got, uh, at the end of it is, is really impressive. So in your cohort, it sounds like you've also created this, um, ambassador sort of system, almost, uh, you know, the graduates going in back to, to university to help you sort of recruit the next wave uh and so it sounds like that's that's something that you've done you know sort of specifically to to to, to scale the program right it sounds like mm -hmm. yeah definitely to get the momentum so um let's uh maybe talk some more about getting you know internally other executives on board my gosh you guys cross car design barrier you know barriers uh or differences you've you talked about learning from from um uh, from the Volkswagen group. What have you done or, or, or had to do that other folks could perhaps replicate to, to get other executives involved? So a lot of times I, I, I hear people say, oh, you know, we just need to do the things that you're talking about doing, but our executive just doesn't get it. Obviously you do, but not, not, not everybody, especially I would imagine in the automobile uh, industry, you, 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 you might have some, some folks that, that, that aren't sort of coming from the let's use AI to solve problems. Um, yeah, so what, what are some of your challenges there and what have you done to sort of break down those barriers and get executives into data and AI too? We're kind of also transitioning to talk a little bit about artificial intelligence, if you don't mind uh, touching on that too. Yeah, and I think it's, it's about building momentum, starting small, showing strong use cases, showing benefits, and then that builds momentum and, and gets more and more people interested. So from a from a again a data literacy point of view, as well as the bringing new uh, future talent into the business, we also focused on our experienced hires, our existing people, uh, to look at how we could upskill them through uh, apprenticeships and and now our data dojo training program, uh, which, which encourages current uh, employees to upskill themselves. Maybe they've they've done a bit of self learning and and done a few YouTube videos and, and got interested in the topic. Um, almost everybody touches data on a daily basis in one form or other. So I think um, we talk uh, our data dojo model starts at white belt uh, in line with uh, martial arts. So the, the white belt is, is basically designed for everybody to, to give a, a common starting point to take away the, the fear from data. Um, uh, uh, to demystify it and again you know talk getting to AI as well um, we don't want this we want to demystify this fear of you know digitalization AI whatever is coming for your job actually it's coming to enrich your job so that you can actually take on more value uh, value add activities the value isn't in creating a graph you know to use the same point the value isn't in creating the graph it's what you're going to do about it to drive a decision and uh, increase the personalization or increase the quality or increase the sales or whatever metric your your particular function is responsible for. So it's about, um, yeah, the white belt is about uh, demystifying it and uh, and taking away the data fear. Uh, and then as you go through the belts to, to orange and, and green belts, that's about asking better questions of data. So any business user that is uh, consuming data, making decisions with data, how do we empower those people to, to make better uh, use of data and then as we get into the blue and brown belts and ultimately the black belt that's about people that are uh, delivering the data products the the dashboards uh, on a daily basis and, and managing that so it's designed as a as a kind of a flight plan we can 
drop in at any level, but we've designed the program to to be cross business. You know, if in two years I get 4,000 Bentley employees through the white belt, then I'll be particularly happy. Uh, I think that's ambitious, but we've got to start with a, a good ambition, haven't we? Do you measure that um, that sort of proliferation of self service? I mean, I know you're a, uh, I think, an ambassador for for Tableau, and you've gotten folks off of Excel, right? I think I have that right, mm-hmm. the, the the title correctly. Do you measure like how many people are accessing data, you know, systematically, or like how do you measure maturity there, going from mm-hmm. you know paper, <laughs> and uh, then I guess Excel, and now and now self service mm-hmm. analytics? How do you think about that as a CDO? Yeah, so it is new this year. It's one of the pillars of my transformation that I brought in. Uh, we've piloted a couple of the belts already, and we're starting to scale it this year. So the, the early adopters, uh, it's going really well. Um, again, the Dojo model helps. Uh, you know, you could sit on a five-day virtual boot camp to learn Tableau, or using the Dojo model, we can do it part-time. We can add in coaching. We can add in masterclasses. We can add in other support to really embed the learning and help uh, people to, to get value from the data, you know, bring your own dashboards and we'll provide coaching on how to improve your own dashboards as you're on that learning journey. So uh, we've got great feedback from the from the early pilots. This year is about scaling it and, uh, yeah, offering it to a wider wider point across the business. That's pretty cool. And I got to ask, do you literally hand out belts to people? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a running joke at the minute. I've stolen my daughter's Bentley bear uh, and, and dressed it uh, in a karate outfit with the bear. So I'm using that as, uh, as the mascot. But uh, we will do stickers, though. We will definitely do stickers and badges uh, to, to gamify it because, yeah, you want to have a bit of fun, right? Yeah, exactly. I, I, I have not. I mean, it's a it's a new one. We didn't prep that. We didn't talk about that in the in in, uh, in leading up to this. So I'm looking for it. I think that'd be really cool to because I think people. I really do think that gives it an identity. You know, a program like that, an identity, and get people excited about it, branding it, and um, having a bit of fun with it uh, is a is a pretty cool idea. I like that. Uh, and it leads into the community as well, because if you're, let's say you're a blue belt, then you can see across the business who else is a blue belt. And it helps build that community of, of practice as well across the business for the sharing of best practice uh, and tips and tricks and so on. And we'll celebrate success in our in our day to days, you know, our, our mini conferences to focus on data as well. So we'll we'll make sure uh, we celebrate success as we go. Let's talk about manufacturing then. Um, you know, I'll, of course, everybody the the hype the hype wagon is about automation, everything automated. Uh, but you're kind of an interesting company, right? Because although those numbers at the start you talked about about going from you know 800, I think, to 15,000 um, cars produced a year, though that's prodigious. But at the same time, compared to you know, as you mentioned, Volkswagen, right? It's 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 uh, the, the rate is not as high and you do a lot of customization. So maybe can you talk about what other folks, I, I mean, I think that customization aspects were particularly interesting. So I can, how does the world of data fit into that kind of a manufacturing environment? And um, again, that uh, perhaps other, other, other folks might learn from and, um, and, and particularly like how do you deal with customization in that context too? And, and what's data's role in that? So I think the, the first point uh, I, I should make is, is about finding the right size solution that fits your business. Uh, so, you know, investing in, in big uh, AI platforms when there isn't a return on investment straight away uh, needs to be um, countered with, with actually what's affordable and what's actually going to drive value. So I think starting, starting small with pilots to prove, prove value and benefit is, is important. And sometimes it's not the right answer to automate everything. Uh, sometimes that person's skill and experience is is still going to be highly important because um, we, we simply don't have the data on 15,000 cars heavily bespoke uh, individually. There isn't the data there to, to build a, a machine learning model to to fully take away the, the benefit of the human eye to really drive the quality into those individual vehicles and, and make sure that we're delivering the best um, customer output. But I think where we can use data is by um, it, it's almost an end-to-end process. It's getting to know our customers better. And then by getting to know our customers, let's say they come and do a factory tour, we know more about our customer now. So we know whether they're a prospect, whether they're a current customer. We know exactly where their car is in the build process. We know what ability we've got to, to offer extra personalization 
uh, and to, to show you how we can enhance the customer journey as we go. So it's about using that data and sharing that data uh, to, to get really the best customer experience possible. How do you think about digital twin? That's the cool the cool brand from you know like Gartner and Forrester talk about um, uh, that a lot. Um, do you sort of have that replica in your data semantic model, if you will, um, and have that flow through to self service? I mean, what or is that sort of uh, an example of data that's really sort of a manufacturing artifact that that doesn't get shared as much? Or where where on the spectrum is the sort of uh, internal view of the, the mythical digital twin of, uh, of these cars as they get produced. Yeah, there's a digital twin of the, uh, the R&D process. There's a digital twin of the manufacturing process. There's then ultimately the digital twin of the, the finished product. You know, the, the we've got, uh, we're looking at, um, you know, effectively a digital twin through the life cycle of the vehicle that could follow the vehicle. So I think there's lots of opportunities to take advantage of digital twins, but it, again, it's about right size for the solution, and uh, and is it a solution looking for a problem um, that uh, yeah might not actually benefit the customer or, or achieve an outcome? Um, having said that, as we move towards uh, digitalization at Bentley, um, we're going to launch five new uh, battery electric vehicles in the next five years. Uh, so 2030 will be 100% uh, battery electric vehicles. That's a big transformation from a company that is known from its uh, 12 cylinder performance petrol cars. And it will drive changes in the manufacturing process as well. From the fixed overhead production line, we'll move to a, an AGV, a much more modular approach, which we can test and learn in a digital environment. It's cheaper and quicker to spin up a, a, a mock up of the environment in the, in the digital domain to test and learn before we ever uh, get near to laying machinery down by which point we've already got some real knowledge of what process flows work, what doesn't, you know, how to optimize layouts and how to optimize material flow to to the line. So we can test out those scenarios quickly in a digital domain before then moving into the physical domain. So a lot of simulation then, uh, data based and uh, using using data in, or I guess a, a synthetic digital twin of a future sort of structure of the car, the foundation, right? And, mm-hmm. and, and simulate that. Fascinating. And, and it's such a cool thing because Bentley, of course, is kind of well known as like the big, you know, like the, the sort of the antithesis of that. And you're 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 taking that innovation and electrification in a really interesting way. Talk about that a little bit before we start to to wind up about. Um, I love your term that you that you guys have sustainable luxury, right? So we're talking about like the technology, sort of the the uh, the, the bleeding edge um, sustainability work that you're, you're you're doing with electrification. But another way to do that is to, I guess, in 101 years, 80 percent of Bentleys are still on the road. How how that's a different take on sustainability. Does that enter explicitly into the way you think about, uh, you know, designing and in, in, in manufacturing cars, it must, or that doesn't happen by mistake. Absolutely. So our, our Beyond 100 strategy, uh, as well as focusing on our people, our customers, uh, a sustainable business model, but very much about sustainability as well. And our, our role as a luxury in the uh, a leader in the luxury domain, um, we take that responsibility seriously. Uh, to lower our carbon footprint, but not only the carbon footprint, but also sustainable materials. You know, the the materials we use, the wood, the leather, and the other materials we're starting to introduce into our cars to make sure that they're from sustainable sources. They may even reuse, um, you know, two, three hundred year old uh, pieces of wood and turn them into a, a different use um, uh, to make them the, the, the product sustainable, um, to, to focus on our manufacturing uh, footprint, whether it's uh, carbon, whether it's uh, water waste, whether it's other um, uh, byproducts of the manufacturing process to really minimize that uh, environmental footprint uh, and balance that out with um, with other initiatives as well. We've got a number of beehives to, as bees within the ecosystem helps the environment, but also produces some pretty exclusive honey as well. So wait a minute, what do you use the bees for in the car? 
The bees are part of the environment. The, the uh, campus we have at Crewe in, in England, uh, they're part of the environment because bees uh, support the sustainability of the environment as well as planting trees and other initiatives to, to really minimise our footprint. So yeah, the bees are a, a kind of a cool part of the journey as well because we get this, uh, yeah, we get the, the honey out of it as a byproduct, and it's uh, it's part of it's all part of the sustainability. It's not just about um, yeah, it's not just about the carbon footprint. It's about other uh, aspects of the footprint as well, uh, taking our, our social role seriously, uh, and not just playing lip service, but living and breathing it. Yeah, I love the examples. These are all fantastic. Really, really good stuff. Well, let's wrap up then with my my one, two, three favorite section, right? Like a favorite quote, um, you know, two books you take to a desert island, if you will. This is great for me because I just learned all sorts of new stuff to read. And then three big takeaways that other CDOs or aspiring CDOs could could learn from from your your experience at Bentley. Okay, so the um, yeah the quote I think uh, it's often attributed to Einstein. I'm not entirely sure how accurate that is, but uh, yeah, the definition of madness is doing the same thing uh, over and over and expecting a different outcome. I love that uh, on, on many different levels, but I think it's it's so true that um, yeah we need to look at new ways of uh, of achieving new outcomes. So it's it supports innovation, it, it supports ambidexterity. It's a good reminder that uh, yeah if we uh, keep doing the same thing we've done for 100 years, will we be relevant for the next 100 years? In terms of the books, um, not necessarily data related, but I like the journeys. Um, it's uh, The two books I'd like to point out are Shoe Dog by Phil Knight uh, and No Rules Rules from Reed Hastings about how Nike and Netflix um, started and, and grew. And I think it's, it's two uh, different stories to a certain extent. Nike's been established a lot longer. Um, Netflix is is quite a brave story in some respects of how they've gone about establishing a new business model and why they've been successful, um, relevant to uh, show the new wave of, of companies coming through. But I think there's still lessons to be learned for incumbent companies like ourselves. We're not going to throw out all our systems overnight, but by looking at others, looking at the Netflix systems, looking at Amazon innovation systems and so on, uh, what can we take and learn from that? So, uh, yeah, some some real uh, nuggets of perseverance and driving transformation uh, in both of those books. The three takeaways, I think uh, the first one is data is a people sport. Um, it, it is about people at the end of the day. Transformation is about people. Uh, the tech is cool and we like to talk about uh, what great things data can do. But unless we can get people to embrace it and to uh, to use it on a daily basis, then all, all the tech in the world isn't going to help us move forwards. And the second one, um, and it's almost a note to self, is is be kind, uh, be kind to yourself. It's great to have a uh, an ambition and a vision, but things still take time to to achieve. And uh, yeah, just be kind to yourself as you go. And the third point is is about celebrating success, recognizing others, appreciating others whether that's in the workplace and but also out of the workplace as well. Awesome, Andy. Uh, the Netflix book, a uh, huge, huge fan mm-hmm. of the way that they've innovated and changed and been ambidextrous, which I think is my favorite theme of the, uh, the day and your, um, <laughs> the model you have about data literacy and uh, bringing people along. It's been great talking to you. So thanks so much for joining us here and uh, for all the insights you shared. And there'll mm-hmm. be links to all the, the resources and references that you've made. And uh, we'll look, look forward to your dojo model too to when it's published we'll have to send that out on social media because i think that's a real nice way of thinking about uh literacy and getting everybody involved and excited about it so thanks a lot for joining us Andy. it's been great great thank you enjoyed the conversation yeah likewise next we'll learn from nicholas a graduate from correlation one's data science for all program and learn about his alternative path to a new data engineering career my name is Nicholas Hansen Frusch, and I'm an 18 year old who currently lives in Washington State. I just want to thank everyone at the C1 team for giving me the opportunity to speak up here and share my story. Uh, and I just want to start off by adding some perspective about the time that we've all spent in this program. Over the past 13 plus weeks that we participated, the sheer amount of knowledge that we've obtained is truly amazing. At the start of the empowerment program, a sizable portion of us didn't even know what a variable in Python was. Now we're writing full-fledged machine learning scripts for fun. And just the fact that we come this far in such a small amount of time is amazing. And it reflects really well on every single one of us. 
Uh, now I want to tell you a little bit about my story and my time as a DS4A fellow, particularly as uh, a high school student who just graduated and has still yet to go to college. So around November of last year, I had to balance a distance learning, uh, the COVID quarantine, moving from California to Washington, and applying to uh, colleges all at once. And come December, due to the crazy circumstances, I found out that I had not been accepted to any of the colleges that I applied to, despite having a 3.8 GPA, which is pretty good in my eyes. I was really worried about my plans for the future, but I was certain that I wanted to be in tech. Having a degree was an important aspect in starting your career. So not really sure where I was destined to go. I applied to the DS4A program. It was actually on the very last night that you could submit the video interview. But this program was the beacon of certainty that I really needed. And uh, I think I speak for a lot of other high schoolers in particular when I say that this really helps us as a, as a group of people. One thing that I've always been adamant about is not strapping yourself down with tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt for something that you might not even end up liking. You know, there has to be a better way than that, right? There has to. And the solution is apprenticeships, internships, and fellowships exactly like what this program is doing. Being exposed to the field in such a supportive learning environment really allows us to see how things are run and if we really like it or not. And I think that DS4 provides a tremendous value in simply exposing us to the world of data science. And that's something I'm super thankful for. Once Data Science for All is able to extend its reach throughout the entire data industry, we might be able to bypass college entirely and go straight into data analyst or scientist roles immediately right out of high school, which is really exciting for, uh, for me. Because just like all of us, this program is also destined for greatness. And uh, luckily, some of that greatness is rubbing off, uh, rubbing off on all of us as well, because this community is full of fantastic, genuine people. We are all in this together, and I could not wish for better people to have gone through this past months with. You guys are all destined for greatness. I can say that with certainty. <laughs> As for Correlation One's vision of battling uh, racism, sexism, and ageism is truly admirable. And I'm so grateful to be able to partake in this experience and for to feel like I have my voice heard. Empowerment really stayed true to its name by empowering all of us to uh, be who we are. And so a final sentiment I would like to leave off with is one of endurance in the form of a quote from a Stoic philosopher, Epictetus. It goes something like, it is the crisis that reveals the person. So when it arrives, remember that nature, like a wrestling coach, has put you up against a rough young antagonist. Why, you ask? So that you can be an Olympic champion, for this cannot be achieved without sweat. For all of us, our data science journey has just begun. And so I want you all to take to heart that it doesn't matter uh, if you end up where you want it to be, only that we surmounted the struggle on the way there. That's what really matters. Thank you. I love Nicholas's determination to succeed and his story should resonate with leaders for three main reasons. Nicholas didn't go to college right after high school. He had to take a different path. And as leaders, we need to acknowledge that different experiences enable unique perspectives. And those perspectives can help mitigate the biases and groupthink that plague decisions across the workforce. Secondly, those new pathways that Nicholas mentions, internships, fellowships, apprenticeships, those are exciting and effective ways for leaders to find new data talent or upskill workers in their own organizations. And finally, the support of the DS4A team and his fellows helped Nicholas launch his career in the face of adversity. The program helped him develop data skills in Python, business intelligence, and other tools. So why does Nicholas's story matter? His journey to his first internship shows that pathways to data careers have changed. Workers like Nicholas need new ways for their talent to be discovered, and it's up to enterprise leaders to transform their workforces so that they can find and nurture talent like Nicholas. We close with a weekly segment we call The Big Number. We heard from Andy Moore about the critical need for organizations to factor their workforce strategy into successful digital transformation, especially for the rapid expansion of AI and automation in the manufacturing industry. We also heard from Nicholas about his alternative career pathway and the data skills that he developed in his data science for all experience. So this week, our big number is 90. That's the estimated percentage of data in the world that was created in the last two years alone. 
Just as we keep creating more and more data across the world, enterprise leaders have to develop workers who can use that massive trove of data to make business impacting decisions. To do that, we need ubiquitous data literacy. We need data humanized. Data Humanized is presented by Correlation One. We're building the enterprise workforce development platform of the future. If you're interested in learning more about how data literacy can power digital transformation at your business, please follow us on LinkedIn and subscribe to our newsletter via our website.